So hopefully you're here for uh, building CSS foundations. I am uh, Jake Smith, uh, Jake Folio on Twitter. There's my website address and email. You need my contact information. Throughout this uh, slide, all the slides, you'll see uh, links everywhere. I went ahead and condensed all that into a Bitly bundle for you. So if you want to just take that down, you won't have to worry about catching every single resource I show. And then I usually toss in a few extras in there also. So I'll give everyone just a second to jot that down real quick. And if you need to at the end, I'll bring it back up. So how many people are familiar with this site? OK, that's good. So for everyone who isn't, the CSS Zen Garden was built, I want to say, late 90s, maybe early 2000s. It's all a blur to me now. Uh, essentially, the site showcased the true power of CSS and all the really cool new hotness you could do. You could take the same HTML structure of a site and make it a completely different design just by setting up the uh, CSS. So it really showcased you know, how you could just move things around, do whatever you need to. But in all the good that CSS Zen Garden brought us, it also kind of crippled us in the same sense. So it, it built these ideas that your HTML will never, you want to build your CSS where your HTML never changes. And so like I, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to write it like this. And so, you know what? never have to change the HTML, you know, so I could go for 10 years, it wouldn't even matter. Well, that's just unrealistic. And you know what, you learned really quickly that that's the case. And another downfall of it is it, it really built a real tight coupling of your CSS and your HTML structure. And that's definitely something you don't want to do. So, essentially, this has been like how I've just taken my career in life. Constant evaluation and self-loathing. So, I'm constantly evaluating tools, techniques, whatever. My, my whole process is a constant evaluation, reevaluation, and then self loathing. I look back three months ago, wow, I really sucked. This was horrible, but I'm so much better today. Then I could look back one day ago and probably say the same thing. So I'm constantly doing this. And so essentially, this is what kind of prompted this talk. I, I, I built a really large uh, travel site which for 10 months, and then it never got launched. Not, not my fault, but it just never got launched. And I ran into a lot of hurdles and a lot of issues. And I was like, wow, if I just thought about it or structured it just a little bit differently, I would have saved myself a ton of headaches. So I'm going to go to the number one thing that pretty much just destroys everything in your projects. And that's specificity. It kills. So. Specificity is hard and especially to pronounce. And if you want, you can play the drinking game with specificity because I'm just going to be saying it a lot. And I, if I get it right every time, that's going to be awesome, but I highly doubt I will. So how many people raise their hands? CSS specificity, you understand what that is and what I'm talking about? OK, majority. So anybody seen this, uh, this picture here, CSS specificity? No, it's, it's cool. It's uh, Estelle Well. Uh, she, uh, she's here at the conference today and was here yesterday, too. Uh, so essentially, I don't really want to spend too much time talking about it, but essentially, it's, it's a number of games. So a, uh, an element, let's say, is one point. Your class and CSS uh, attribute selectors are 10 points also. Uh, an ID is worth 100. If you do an inline style, it's worth 1,000. And then the uh, nuclear bomb that is important is a million. So it rule, it's the uh, one that rules them all. So segue into that. Do not carpet bomb your elements. And what I mean by this is don't create generic blanket statements. How many people think this is a good idea? No, no you don't want to just say every div on my page is going to be this style because you're going to waste your time resetting something you just set all the time. But the thing that frustrates me even more is, why is this acceptable? I see this all the time. People do this constantly. That's no different than just doing that to your div. The same problem. The, the fact is, if you're following 
if you're using the header element like you're supposed to, it can show up inside a section, it can show up inside an article, and a lot of WordPress themes do this. So people will start stylizing something and then they'll throw it into the WordPress and everything blows up because you, you carpet bombed your header tag. You said, hey, all headers are just gonna do this because you're thinking structurally, this is the header of my page. And that's acceptable to use that, but don't, you can't do something like this. A better solution would be give it an ID, which I, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the IDs and I'll get into that in just a second. You could have a class of header or you could actually say something like this, where the uh, header is the first child of body. So that's another way if you would prefer to do that with no uh, class styles. So that was a pretty basic example. So here, here's a different one, header UL. The problem is you're still carpet bombing, it, you're blanket statementing everything. So most likely, if I'm looking at this, Somebody's thinking this is their main navigation. Header UL, okay, yeah. What if it was their, what if they had social icons in their header also? What if they had a global nav that showed up in the header also? Well, now I just said all ULs are gonna act like this, and that's probably not the case and not what you really wanted. How about sidebar div? That's pretty, pretty generic. You're still doing the same thing. You're carpet bombing, you, you've, you've defined a context but you're still making that blanket statement that every single div that ever shows up, what if you have like a third party widget or something that you know, it generates its own HTML? Like you may not have complete control over something and it's gonna end poorly for you. And uh, the last one it, I have is content P. Um, the fact is there's always gonna be a chance that text is not gonna be in a P tag every time, especially in your content. You could be inside of a section tag and there might not be a P tag there. You know, there's all sorts of situations where that's just not going to work out. So essentially, all that to say, CSS is easy, naming stuff is hard. So we're gonna play a little game here called Guess That Element. So I have a sidebar div. Now, what do you think that might be? I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a guessing game. I'm like, it could be whatever. It's a promo box. Isn't that so much easier to say, hey, this is a promo box. That we're being very specific with what we're doing there. Header UL. Once again, in my mind, I see this all the time, so I know what the person is most likely saying, but why not just come out and say it? Nav main. H2 span, anybody want to take a guess at what that's going to be? Tagline. So, stop making people guess what you're wanting it to do. Be very specific with your intent. And that's essentially what I'm going to say here is, clear intent is the end goal here. You know, don't, don't make me or the developer coming in after you, or maybe yourself one year from now, coming back to this code, trying to guess what's going on. So, kind of just another like tip essentially is do not overqualify your declarations. So, a lot of people do something like this. They'll define ul.nav primary div header body to call. So, essentially in my mind I know what they're they're doing. They're they're trying to, you know, take control and say, "Hey, you know, this, these are the only situations you need to use these and I'm giving you directions on how to do uh, how I want this structured." Well, the problem is, what if the nav primary, you have like a big, big content blocks and you have actual like divs inside of it and it actually doesn't live in a UL anymore? What if you wanted to use an OL? It's, it's not gonna work then. You gotta you change it up. Div header, what if I wanna get the new, uh, new HTML5 hotness? I wanna use a section or I actually literally wanna use the header element. That's not gonna work now. And not only that is, you're, you're also increasing your CSS specificity, and you're gonna create a battle for yourself. You're gonna constantly be fighting with yourself by doing this. So essentially, just do not let your CSS dictate your HTML structure at all, you know? Let it be free. So, constraints are good, but you know, not in, when it comes to the CSS specificity. So, I have right here, let's make specificity easy. 
so, but you saw how I condensed a couple of uh, examples and made them to single class names. So wouldn't it be great if a lot of your uh, CSS was all just one to two classes? You wouldn't have to spend the constant guessing game of, hey, is this gonna override that? Uh, what do I need to get over here? You know, it's, it's really simple. You're using a class here and a class there. It's easy to know what's going to override the other. So I have avoiding, uh, avoid using IDs. I, I personally do not use IDs. I don't like to. Um, it creates an even bigger CSS specificity hell for you. Um, I use them purely for uh, JavaScript hooks. So if you wanted to access something through JavaScript, that would be the way to do it. I have an asterisk there for the simple fact that some people, they, they prefer it, and they want it, and they're like, well, it's only gonna show up once in the page, so you know, it really, yeah, that doesn't matter. Your, your point's moot, Jake. I'm like, okay, but here, here's a rule for it. If you're going to use an ID, you know, that, that ID can only be called once on the page. So I challenge you to only reference that ID once in your CSS. Define the structure, never reference it again. Because that's where you get yourself in trouble. You're like, oh, okay, well, in the sidebar of this, I want to change here. Now you just, you've just created a, you know, an endless uh, hole for yourself. So one ID per page, one ID in your style. So modular development. How many people have been reading about modular development? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Good times. So pretty much it, I, I came to this decision right here. So stop developing pages and start uh, developing systems. So essentially in this giant mess of a travel site I was working on, I was getting bits and pieces kind of piecemealed to me. So a little bit here, a little bit there. And like it's, I swear we had a new theme like every other week. So an, another theme came rolling in, rolling in. So I started off with it. I'm like, okay, oh, I got this template. I'm gonna cut it up, get it all done. Uh, awesome. Okay, I have this layout. Oh, a designer sent me a new page. Okay, I'll cut it all up. Okay, this is another layout, and another layout, and another layout. And essentially, if I just stopped, said, let me break this down into very small components that don't care about anything besides just living in its little box, my life would have been a lot easier. And essentially, that's what going into modular development is going to do for you. So, very brief history, object-oriented CSS. Uh, anybody, Nicole Sullivan? Hands, anybody? Yeah, okay. So, essentially, she, uh, I don't know if she officially worked at Facebook or just contracted, either way. The fact is she, uh, she did work for Facebook and noticed a lot of redundancy. I mean, tons and tons of redundancy. And so, she saw that you could simply break something down into, like I said, you simplify it into a very small component, super basic. It's called her the media object. And this is kind of like a little example of what that is. So we have media element on the left, content on the right. Or we have the reverse, content on the left, media on the right. And the thing is, when you look at it, that media element could be anything. It could be a video, it could be a picture, it could be an icon. So it could be anything that has image left, content right. Now think of how, how much you could break down all the sites that you've done with just a simple media on the left, content on the right. If you actually stop and look at it and just you know, simplify it, turn it into literally like a wireframe, you could probably solve a lot of your problems just with one little object. Now this, uh, this actual code example of this is uh, from the Inuit CSS framework. Um, so the link's down there if you wanna check that out. And he's using SAS. So if you're looking at it and wondering what is this dollar signs mess there, that's what he's using. And with that, there's uh, Inuit CSS and then Smacks. It's Jonathan Snook. So here's the, here's the difference between the two. Essentially, Inuit CSS follows Nicole Sullivan's you know, objects. And he built, Harry Roberts is the guy who uh, built it. And he built all these small objects for you. Like he has a nav object, which will literally break down a uh, ULI to be a common format for you for your uh, for a nav, and then he has a little object where you can actually it can be a stack, it can be inline, whatever. 
but he, he does the base work for you. He does all the basics there. He has all sorts of great objects, and so you could say, I guess you could say it's a framework, but he's giving you the, the, tool, the blocks to build your own. Smax, on the other hand, is more conceptual. Uh, Jonathan Snook wrote a book. It's a great book, and I think it would really change the way you write CSS. If you, if you get a chance, please you know, go, go buy it. It's worth every penny. Uh, Smax, S-M-A-C-S-S. And so he, he, breaks it, he breaks everything down into modules and submodules. And that's where we go. So I have module and object up here just because Smax refers to things as modules and Inuit refers to stuff as objects and essentially they're talking about the same thing. So I didn't want anyone to get confused on there being actually difference between the two. So essentially, you know, as I said earlier, we you know, you know, don't want any kind of CSS dictating our HTML. So separate your structure from your style. And that's what I'm going to go through here with my example. So how many people have actually used Bootstrap, Zurb Foundation, anything like that? Okay, a good amount. So I mean, so a button is pretty common in all these frameworks, libraries, whatever. So essentially what I have here is the uh, base button object. And literally I just have a class of button and it just, it sets things up you notice I'm not styling anything. I'm not defining the size of anything, really. Yes, I have a default padding right there, but that's not really me de deciding the size. And I'm telling the text decoration to be none. So I'm just I'm setting up the very bare basics I need a button to do. So right here, I have three different elements. I have an input with the class of BTN. I have a link with the class of BTN and I have an actual button with the class of BTN. So essentially right there, those are what those three look like if it was just that class. Very, very basic. So that was our, our base object or module. So what if I create a sub-module right here? I extend that button. Right here I have my BTN small, BTN medium, BTN large, BTN extra large. So like I said, you're, you're seeing the syntax is very similar in structure to a bootstrap and how they follow it. And then I have my BTN primary, and that's where all the styling is. So essentially, is I separated it out. I, I use one sub-module just to take the job of sizing, and another sub-module to take the responsibility of just styling. So let's say I just set, set the size. So we have BTN, BTN large. So BTN is your module. BTN large is the submodule. And like I said, BTN is just to set you up. BTN large is to actually define size. And that's all. That's all we want BTN large to do. Just define size. Right here, I have the large and the primary. So primary takes the responsibility of styling. And look, all three of those elements, all those buttons look the same, but they're different types of elements. I didn't, there's no constraint on, on you. You want to use an input, that's fine. You want to use a link, cool. You want to use the actual button element, awesome. There you go, look. They all look the same. That's all I'm looking for. So here's kind of like a just small little breakdown of what, what I did here. So once again, the base module is the BTN, and then the sub-modules are separated out. So essentially what I'm wanting you to do is abstract out the responsibilities into th their own module. So right here I have a layout from, I think it's from Theme Forest, that you know, I just downloaded. So how many people would just re receive a, a design like this from a designer? How many people? Does, you get it from the designer most times? So you get this and like automatically your mind's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock this out of the park. All right, uh, right here we have featured posts are right there. I got my recent post and then I have my active members. Okay, well, Let's, uh, let's pump the brakes a little bit, and let's, uh, let's take a step back, and let's, let's, uh, let's really think about what's going on here. Remember what I said? Most things break down to just image left, content right. So I'm just kind of show, showing this just for the sense that I used it. So this is the media object again.
and right here is the media list. So media list is actually the, uh, is my base uh, module. I'm just uh, creating a list of media items. And right here, I actually do uh, media list, media item, and then an LI. So the reason I do that is I, I want to provide freedom. If you don't want to stylize something using a list, you can use something else. And I, I think it always ends up working out really well. And then I define the grid. So if I wanted to lay something out in a grid, I changed the layout based off where, and you see I'm not constraining myself to any specific elements either. And then at the bottom, ooh, wow, that jumped up. Uh, at the bottom, you have the media featured list, and that's a sub-module right there. It's a sub-module of media list. So here, here's an example of my actual, of the actual, uh, div example and the li example. So I took that same, same code you just saw and I'm able to break it out into divs using that or I could uh, just stick with a regular uh, list and do that, but it's going to react the same exact way and that's key. So essentially I have my layout element which is lgrid which is telling it, hey, you're, you know, the layout needs to be laid out in a grid. My media module which is what I said is uh, Nicole Sullivan's media object I have another module called media list, and then the sub-module media featured list. And the media fe featured list is what brings the styling to that one. So essentially, we'll break this down again. It's gonna be a media list there, a media list there, and a media list there. The only thing that is different is some of them are a grid and some of them aren't. So right here is actually like what Oh, man, that didn't show up well at all. That's horrible. Damn. Because uh, I use, should have used a darker background. Uh, so essentially, that's what the uh, media list uh, looks like based off of uh, that uh, comp. I just kind of, it, it's all using just media list and then the featured list at the top. And the only thing the featured list d did stylistically was it said, I want the width to be this, this wide. That way the content lines up perfectly, which you can't read. Awesome on my part. But I, I kind of like the whole like little avatar setup at the bottom, you know. It's a media object with no, no content. So just one rule I wanted to bring up is cont context must not modify your modules. So if I put a module, if I create a module, I want, you want to think of it as a box. This box does not care what's outside of it. We're not thinking outside the box today, people. We're thinking inside the box. So, it only cares about what's inside the box. It doesn't care about outside. So it's gonna react the same way no matter where you put it. If I wanna put that module in the header, the main content sidebar or footer, it should function the exact same way. If you, need, if you need it to be different in some sense, if you want it to be full width or constrained, create a sub-module for that stylistic stuff. So, segue into the next section, code, code standards and styles. Anyone actually, uh, anybody's company follow a code style, code standards? No? Awesome. <laughs> this section's gonna be good then. Okay, so, um, so formatting. So uh, the important thing to think about when it comes to the code standards and styles and what brings it all together and makes it awesome. How many people have actually worked on a project that like 20 developers have worked on? Yeah. And you can always look at it and go, I know who wrote that. You can always look at it and you know. The goal is to get it to where it doesn't, it looks like one developer wrote the entire thing. So this is uh, kind of the way I follow things and uh, so right here, I say hyphen separated names. I don't do camel casing. So hyphen se separated. I'm setting up that rule right away. There's always a space between the property and the value. I like, I, I'm not afraid of white space, and most times if you're in production, you've minified your CSS, so it doesn't even matter. So when I'm there, I want to see it spaced out nice and pretty. I'm not afraid of white space. I only, only do inline if there's one property. 
As soon as it's more than one property, break it out. Especially if you're using like uh, the new CSS3 stuff, like the gradient, you're going to want to multi-line that, or you're going to get lost really quickly. So if you're doing single line for everything, it's, you know, I, you know, I'm telling you this is the way to go. It's, it's so much easier to read. I can see where the elements are, everything. So one selector per line. So I, I like to break it out so I can easily see what, has, uh, what is being uh, styled for. So each uh, selector, one per line. Declaration order. How many people uh, alphabetize their, de their declaration? OK, I used to do the same thing. And the one thing that drove me absolutely nuts, and I wanted to break my own rules, was width and height. So if you ever had width and height, if you're following alphabetical, there's a lot of stuff that falls in between. Logically, they should be next to each other. So, doing something like this, and you don't have to put the comments in, this is just the showcase for here. Um, start off with the positioning, if you're actually defining the positioning, and then go to the display and uh, box model. Then break it out into whatever the other stylistic stuff there is, typography, and then I always put, uh, Preprocessors, less SAS stylus, anybody? Hands? I know, I'm making you do a lot of work in this presentation. Uh, I always put them at the bottom, so I always know where they're gonna be, and it's just, you know, consistently, always there, works out well for me. So, moving on to documentation. This is something that is pretty foreign in CSS. Um, I, uh, I, I'm a PHP developer, so I, I write a lot of back-end code, and I document the crap out of it. I mean, and it helps with my IDE, any kind of uh, documentation uh, generation, whatever. And it keeps the other teammates sane. So I follow a similar uh, dot block type setup. So at the top, I, I define Oh, laser pointer doesn't work either. That's awesome. Uh, I define the title right there, primary site navigation. Then I have a tag section. I have a little caret list, caret navigation. So I actually uh, snagged that, uh, that tagging tip from uh, Harry Roberts. He said, you know, the caret's pretty much never used. So it's really easy if you're grepping or just searching for uh, any kind of CSS that's utilizing those tags, it's easier to find. Um, right here, it extends the nav. So what I'm saying is we have our base nav object, and this is an extension. This is a sub-module of that nav, which is nav main. And then I have format. So I can showcase you know, an example of how you might use this and where it would be useful. I know this seems like a lot of work. And believe me, it's going to take time to get you there. But you will be so thankful when you get there because it'll become second nature, and it will really, really help out a lot. And to pretty much sum up that whole section, predictability and consistency. I would, it always wins out, and you might as well change that to say readability and maintainability, because if I, if I can predict how something is gonna be done, it, it, it makes life so much easier when you, once again, it should look like one developer has touched it. When 17 different people are doing something, you never know what you're gonna get, where you're gonna get. So this is, this pretty much sums up that whole section. So, that uh, a lot of these standards and stuff that I was just going over, the coding standards, are a lot, they're pretty much based off of this right here, Nicholas Gallagher, Gallagher, I can't remember his last name. Link's down there, it was also in the bit.ly link. So he, post, he posted essentially a CSS code standards. And I loved it so much because I already pretty much followed it to the T. So I was like, awesome, I'm adopting this. This is gonna be great. And I'm finding more and more companies are doing that. They're going to GitHub, they're posting out, hey, this is our, our, sta our standards and styles. And that way it's there. Any developer on your team can just go out, get in like, hey, here are the rules, follow them. Uh, another one that's been around for a while, but uh, I guess official official in uh, uh, their coding standards or books is the WordPress one. 
and it's really not too far off from the way uh, Nicholas uh, did stuff. So uh, that's also another good one to take a look at. And I, I just, you know, like I said, just it doesn't have to be like all up at once. Maybe you're starting a new project and you're like, hey, everybody, let's, you know, try to come to an agreement on something and let's stick to it for this one project and then see, watch it grow. So organization and structure. So things obviously get unwieldy and you want to like, you know, you get that free time to really organize everything. You're very meticulous in how you're doing it, et cetera. You know, abstraction and modularity is great until it's not. So essentially I've run into this. If it takes more than five seconds to figure out where you want to put something, you're probably gone too far because you get really excited and you start putting stuff everywhere and I'm like, okay, well this, well in this scenario, this would go here and there and this. The problem is, yeah, it's super organized now, but it's so organized you've built a giant complexity that is gonna confuse any other developer and most likely confuse yourself later on. So with any project that you do, start with the bare minimum. I usually have like a, uh, a vendor folder in my CSS, so like if I have any kind of plugins or anything that, that has its own CSS that I didn't create myself, it goes into the vendor folder. And it really makes it easy if I just pulled something off GitHub and it's all separate into that folder. So some tools and resources. CSS Lint, has anyone actually run their CSS through this? How, how, how much did it like you? Did it, did it hate you much? <laughs> it's built to hate you. No, no, it's, it's, it's really awesome. It, uh, it really is, and uh, it's, it's, it's humbling also too. Uh, it, it's Nicole Sullivan, once again, and um, pretty much ha she has all these standard rules, and it will, you put your CSS in, and it'll throw back warnings or whatever for stuff that you're breaking, essentially. You're not doing, you're not following those standards correctly. Uh, what's great about CSS Lint, there's also uh, a node uh, package called, that you can use for CSS Lint, so you can actually do it on the command line, so you don't actually have to go to a site and constantly do it. Also, there's Grunt, which is kind of a build tool for JavaScript, um, and it allows you to actually have like a JSON file that has all these rules in there, so like it would make it really easy to share out between your team members and uh, possibly hook it up with uh, continuous integration like Jenkins, if anyone's using that. And going back to code standards, uh, so this is uh, PHP code sniffer. I know, I know, a lot of people aren't PHP people, and that's, that's not the point of this. It's a tool that really is really useful. Like, we have it at my place for our PHP, and uh, it has all sorts of CSS uh, rules that you can set up. So we use Git as our version control system, and so when I make a commit, it's gonna right away tell me uh, if, uh, if I pass code, code standards. And if not, it's like, hey, boom, warning, here's the lines that you screwed up, go fix it before it'll be allowed into the actual repo. So instituting something like that would be really helpful. Uh, and I definitely check it out. There's also, I mean, just the screenshot from this page, you see they have a HTML code sniffer, which is actually a bookmarklet. Bookmark lit. And, um, it's, it's pretty helpful too. It uh, shows like, uh, gives you tips and warnings on like 508 compliance and stuff like that. So, to recap, naming is hard, so be clear with your styles. Don't, don't play the developer guessing game. Let me know exactly what you're trying to do, what you're trying to style. Don't let your styles define your HTML structure creates complexity and limits modularity. And like I said, don't let context drive your styles. Small modules are easier to maintain. Think inside the box, not outside the box. Consistency and predictability always went out. I would much rather a code base be very consistent and predictable than, you know, like, Andy Hume says 100% correct. He, he would prefer it over correctness, because he's like, at least I know where to get something and fix it then. And I have to kind of agree with him on that one. I would prefer consistency and predictability over correctness. 
and document for tomorrow's developer. This could easy, very easily be you. This could be a new developer to your team, whatever. Document to save yourself and your whole team. Questions, concerns, complaints? OK, well, uh, I do have a, uh, a uh, speaker rate. I would love feedback. I need feedback, good, bad, et cetera. You're too slow. You're too fast. You just suck. Whatever. I need to know. So uh, if you could you know, give me a rating, that'd be great. It's also in the, bit, the Bitly bundle I showed in the beginning, but I just thought I'd show this again. Um, once again, th thanks for listening. Hope you have a great day.